Welcome everyone to this Ask an Expert series. We are glad you are here. We will get started in just a couple of minutes. As you're joining, feel free to use the chat box um, feature in this meeting and let us know who you are and, and say hello to the others that are in the meeting. And also let us know where you're from and what your organization is. And as people are coming in, we have a, a poll question that we would love for you to take just a minute to respond to. And then there are two features in the meeting. The, the chat functionality is um, really for casual conversation between the, the um, participants. Um, I will also be sharing some links as our panelists share out resources. So feel free to continue using that throughout the meeting. And we can go ahead and get started. We're we're right at uh, three o'clock. So welcome again for being here. And my name is Tracy Staffis, and I am um, communication support for the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center. And we are very excited to have you for this series of conversations entitled Ask an Expert. This series convenes skilled practitioners um, with registered participants to discuss topics related to human trafficking. Um, so please continue to uh, use the chat feature. And also as you have questions for our panelists, there will be time at the end. So please use the Q&A feature um, to drop in your questions so that our moderator can easily pull um, the questions from there. All right, we'll give everyone just a, another few seconds to answer the poll questions and then we'll move right into our agenda. And if you're just joining us, please take a moment to let us know where you're from and um, which organization you're representing in the chat and we'll get started. Okay, moving on to our agenda slide. Uh, this format today is a discussion by a panel of experts and we will be exploring labor trafficking. Um, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please submit your questions and we will address those at the end of the formal remarks. Any question that is not answered during this live discussion will be answered in a Q&A document that will be distributed after the event to all registered um, participants. So now I am pleased to turn the time over to Bill Wolf. He is the Senior Advisor for Victim Services and the Human Trafficking Program Director with the Office for Victims of Crime. Um, Bill, over to you. Thank you, Tracy. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending uh, where in the world you all are. Uh, really thankful for the opportunity for you all to be able to engage in this conversation today and for our, the Office of Victims of Crime to be able to, to help host uh, and support this event. As you all know, victims of human trafficking face so many hurdles, and the Office of Victims of Crime is really committed to helping survivors escape unimaginable situations, empowering them to start new lives for themselves, and even in some situations for their kids or their families. 
And I've truly been blessed to work with an incredible group of dedicated, compassionate professionals at OBC. It's been uh, one of the most rewarding experiences of my life, uh, working alongside professionals like uh, Kristen Weschler, who is, is joining today. As many of you know, in the year 2000, the United States passed landmark legislation codifying our commitment to eradicate human trafficking. And this year marks the 20th anniversary of that legislation. In fact, next Wednesday is the anniversary itself, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. The TVPA identified a three-pronged approach to address this issue, protection, prevention, and prosecution. Oftentimes, we refer to those as the three Ps. This approach recognizes the importance of holding traffickers accountable, protecting survivors, and preventing victimization from occurring in the first place. Just this week, the administration released the first ever national action plan to combat human trafficking. The president's national action plan calls for several efforts to prevent, protect, and prosecute, drawing particular attention to the issue of labor trafficking. Our office leads the Department of Justice's response efforts funding grantees that provide services to victims of human trafficking in 46 states and in some of the territories and Washington, D.C. as well, representing more than 400 awards totaling over $270 million. Many of those grants go to you all that are here today, and I appreciate the time that you've taken to participate in this important conversation. This year, OVC continued the development of, in my opinion, one of the coolest resources that we have to offer, and that is the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center, which is hosting the, this incredible webinar today. So a big shout out to Tracy and her entire team. Uh, I was on a webinar earlier with uh, Abby and just all the incredible work that they do to help build capacity in the field to address this issue and, and support victims of crime. We've come a long way over the past 20 years, but we recognize that there is still more work to be done. The whole of government approach embraced by this administration and coordination and collaboration with all of you on the front lines of combating this issue will bring about real change. And we know that we have to collectively continue to work hard to bring traffickers to justice and help victims heal. We know that uh, the work your organizations are doing is making a tremendous impact for good, and we are truly thankful for your commitment. This conversation today will help you in your efforts to address labor trafficking. Today, our panel of experts will share information about potential indicators of labor trafficking, discuss the more vulnerable industries to labor trafficking, and provide information on the broad range of resources available to help organizations and tribes start sustain or grow their support services for victims of trafficking. Our office stands ready to support you all on the front lines. So I just wanna say very sincerely, thank you for all the work that you do to serve victims of human trafficking and hold offenders accountable. I'd now like to turn it over to our moderator, Gonzalo Martinez de Elia. Gonzalo is a published author and expert on the topic of labor trafficking. He is currently working as a senior program manager at Verite, focusing on ethical recruitment in the Americas. Previously with the McCain Institute's Combating Human Trafficking Team, Mr. Martinez designed and implemented interventions to counter forced and coerced labor in the Texas agricultural sector. Gonzalo is also a member of the Field Advisory Committee for the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center. So with that, thank you all. Thank you to our team of experts and Gonzalo, Gonzalo over to you. Thank you, Bill, and we will jump right in. We want to save as much time as possible for you all to give us your uh, thoughts and questions so that we can have more of a discussion towards the second half of the hour. So without any delay, I will jump right in. Again, this is, if you've only joined us now, part of the Ask an Expert series, and today's session is on Labor Trafficking 101, Learning the Basics. Joining me today are three panelists, Megan Mahoney, Mike Rios, and Katie Fl uh, Flannelly. Um, Megan is the Deputy Director of Framework, which aids service providers and their community partners to identify and provide transformative services to survivors of labor trafficking. Welcome, Megan. Thanks, Gonzalo. Hi, everybody. 
Mike is an enforcement coordinator with the U.S. Department of Labor focused on agriculture in the southeast region of the United States. How are you all today? And Katie had a two-year fellowship at IUDA funded by Equal Justice Works, which mobilized fellows across the country to deliver legal assistance and enforce the rights of crime victims. Her fellowship focused on serving immigrant survivors of human trafficking. And she is now a Virginia staff attorney still with IUDA, in, um, which again is a Washington DC based organization providing legal social and language services to help low-income immigrants access justice and transform their lives. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. Well, Megan, Mike, Katie, let's get started. As we all know, human trafficking, including sex and labor trafficking, is compelling a person through force, fraud, or coercion to engage in commercial sex or forced or unfair labor. Trafficking can take root in any community, in an urban or rural community, impacting any demographic and cutting across all races, genders, and socioeconomic classes. Today, our discussion focuses on labor trafficking. We will be discussing potential indicators, industries more frequently subject to labor trafficking, and resources available to help you as victim service providers start, um, start sustain, and grow support services for victims of labor trafficking. When we look back to the last 20 years of, uh, since the TVPA, I think it's fair to say that there really has been more activity on the types of human trafficking that involve commercial sex than on labor trafficking, generally speaking. But today on the panel, we do have three experts that, are, that have been at the forefront of designing and implementing better approaches to labor trafficking. So I'm really eager to get their insights here for you today. But before we get too far into it, let's make sure that we have a good baseline definition. Starting with you, Mike, um, as I mentioned, labor trafficking is the compelling of a person through force, fraud, or coercion to perform unfair or forced labor. So in your capacity at the US Department of Labor, Mike, when you are out in the field, um, specifically in the agricultural sector, what are some potential indicators of labor trafficking that you would train your staff to be on the lookout for? Sure, sure, certainly. Uh, just wanna make sure you can hear me okay? Yeah, great, fantastic. So certainly, yeah, um, unfortunately, and I, and I really do mean unfortunately, the agricultural industry has always played a role uh, in labor trafficking uh, all over the world and, and certainly in the United States as well. Uh, with the explosion of the H-2A guest worker program, uh, labor trafficking has increased, right? It just, it's, it only had one, one way to go and that was up. Uh, in 2019, we had somewhere around 260,000 H-2A workers that were certified to work in the United States. Uh, many of these workers are employed by farm labor contractors who provide labor to farms all across the country, but mainly in the Southeast region of the United States. Um, many H-2A workers are charged exorbitant fees, recruitment fees, they call them, right? Uh, and are often indebted to the farm labor contractor before even arriving in the United States, already a sign of labor trafficking, right? Uh, once in the United States, these unscrupulous farm labor contractors will also confiscate workers' passports, right? Uh, another indicator of trafficking. Um, oftentimes, workers are also threatened with deportation by ICE should they complain. Now, mind you, all H-2A workers receive, receive a U.S. visa, right? They're, they're not here illegally at all. Uh, they have legal status throughout the validity of the H-2A contract, uh, but still they get convinced uh, that should they stray or do something that the contractor does not like, uh, they're threatened with deportation. So the control over the worker is, is total, right? Uh, farm labor contractors will sometimes force workers to travel to previously undisclosed locations. The contract states they're going to be in one place and we find them elsewhere. Uh, they transport them from, for example, Florida or Georgia to Michigan or Wisconsin or Indiana or, or any other location. Um, in some instances, farm labor contractors transport workers um, to other states well past the end date of the certified H-2A contract, which is obviously at the same time well past the validity period of the workers' visas. And that causes fear and insecurity and uncertainty for the workers. 
Um, it's important to note, uh, and I wanted to mention that right up front, that the agency that I work for, which is the Wage and Hour Division of the U.S. Department of Labor, um, when we when our investigations identify signs of trafficking, um, a referral is made to our sister criminal agencies, uh, such as Office of Inspector General or the FBI or Homeland Security Investigations. So that's a close look at how labor trafficking is manifesting in the agricultural sector. We know from looking at the numbers every year that agriculture, unfortunately, is only one of several sectors that show up over and over again in criminal indictments re re relating to labor trafficking. So sort of taking a step back and looking at these other higher risk sectors such as uh, domestic servitude, restaurant, um, landscaping, factories, healthcare. Megan, as you look out across your network and in, across the United States, you know what are the similarities in these sectors with what Mike described in agriculture, what are the differences in how labor trafficking manifests in, in these settings? Sure, so there are a couple of common threads here. For one, you know, as humans, we're all wired the same way, right? To seek opportunities that will improve our lives and the lives of the people that we love. Um, traffickers are very good at identifying what's meaningful to a person and then exploiting that. So the promise of a job for somebody who's living in poverty or love and affection for someone who's been abused and neglected, um, the opportunity to travel for someone who has never left their birthplace or an education for someone who's looking to advance professionally. Um, so people sign up for an opportunity and then they're met with a really different reality. So that's a pretty universal experience across industries. You mentioned a handful of them, Gonzalo. Um, it really, it could happen in any industry. So commonly we see it in domestic work, um, you mentioned a couple of these construction restaurants. We also see it in things like carnivals, elder care, um, child care, uh, in drug sales. And we see it also intersect with the sex industry in places like massage parlors and escort services and strip clubs. So the susceptibility to exploitation is a common factor. Um, another common factor is the presence, obviously, of forced fraud and coercion. You know, victims across industries experience the same type of violence, threats, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse that make them afraid to leave or feel like they have no choice but to stay. Um, Mike mentioned a couple of the other uh, factors that we see taking um, their legal documents away from them. Debt bondage is, is rampant um, and threats against family members, including in another country. If you tell me I'm going to hurt your sister, I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do. So that's a really common tactic as well. In terms of differences between agriculture and some of the other, other industries, um, you know, Mike did a good job talking about the, some of the exploitation that happens in agriculture. And I think to many of us, that's not surprising given what we know about the exploitation of immigrants, um, especially those who are here under the guest worker program or who are undocumented. Um, I think it's harder to imagine it happening in industries that we intersect with, that we can see with our own eyes. Um, it's harder to imagine that your suburban neighbor is trafficking their housekeeper or their nanny. It's hard to imagine that the kid operating the Ferris wheel at the state fair is being trafficked or the person who did your pedicure or turned down your hotel room or um, who fixed your roof or who's caring for a parent in a nursing home. You know, we refer to this as a, a hidden crime, um, but I think when it comes to a lot of these industries, it happens right in front of our eyes. That's the bigger picture. And Katie, I want to turn to you uh, to talk about how these um, trends look at, at, in a very practical day-to-day -day way to, to a service provider. Your agency, Ayuda, has been working with victims of crime for many, many years. And um, it, within that, you work directly with victims of labor trafficking. So in, from your perspective, uh, what are some of the challenges in reaching the victims of labor trafficking that we've been discussing so far? Um, so I think to pick up on that same thread from what Megan was just saying, um, it is really hard to imagine that labor trafficking is going on right under our noses. And it can also be very difficult for victims to put a name to what they've experienced. And because of that, 
identification is really one of the biggest challenges in reaching victims of labor trafficking because victims almost never self-identify. Um, and unlike sex trafficking, which is often flagged for us at Ayuda in referrals that we get from partners, for example, um, I would say that in the majority of our labor trafficking cases, our attorneys are the ones identifying that this person has been a victim of labor trafficking for the very first time. Um, and I think the definition of labor trafficking encompasses a lot of different sets of behaviors and can look like a lot of different things. Um, and that can be a real challenge. So knowing the legal definition, I think is really important as a lawyer. Um, and for non-lawyers, I would say you don't need to get into the nitty gritty details of the legal definition necessarily, but stay in alert to the indicators, the kinds of things that Mike was mentioning is really, really key. Um, there are some great resources that I think will be shared with you by the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center after this um, session is over. And I know that those documents have laid out some of those key indicators. Um, and I think that it's just you take those to heart and you learn them and you, you pay attention to them when you see them. Um, and then just in addition to the industries that Mike and Megan also mentioned, I would just add that a lot of the labor trafficking that we see unfortunately happens within families and within the home. Um, and that can add an entire different dimension to identification because the victim may still be economically, emotionally, legally dependent on the person who is their trafficker. And so just to flag that that adds a lot of additional challenges. Thank you. And we will circle over to that topic uh, later in the questions, hopefully, because I think there's a lot to unpack there. But um, sort of um, moving on um, here along one of the um, what one of the topics, you know, we've been discussing uh, the fraud within the guest worker visa program. Katie, I think many of the clients within your agency are likely to be foreign nationals. Um, many of these actually scenarios that we've mentioned usually involve immigrants. However, we know that US citizens all are vulnerable to labor trafficking as well. Um, and I wonder, Megan, if you could elaborate on that a little bit and tell us about how trafficking looks like on, on that side of things. Sure, I'm really glad that you asked this question. Um, we've talked about immigration status as a vulnerability factor, but we also know that for US citizens and lawful permanent residents, the playing field is not level in terms of equal opportunity and protection, right? Especially for black and brown people. Um, we don't have enough time today to talk about all of the ways that systemic racism perpetuates human trafficking, um, but the racial wealth gap alone, I think proves the point. Um, the Brookings Institute talked about the net worth of a typical white family being nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family. Um, black women, we also know, make 62 cents on the dollar compared to white men. Latinas make just 54 cents. So, you know, people living in poverty are not in a powerful position to assert their rights in the workplace or to walk away from a job when they're being abused. Um, we talk about these so often like they're separate issues like human trafficking is over here and all these other social injustices happen over here, but they are very connected. And I think one of the big challenges when addressing labor trafficking is that we have compassion for the person who's been trafficked, but before they're trafficked, we don't think about them as often. We don't protect them in the same way. Um, and there's a lot of vulnerability among a lot of populations, runaway and homeless youth, for example, people who identify as LGBTQI+, members of the disabled community, people experiencing homelessness, um, people who suffer from mental health and substance use disorders. Um, so there's a lot of work to do um, to protect people and then also to make sure that we're identifying them because we don't always think of, of domestic victims when we think of labor trafficking. Um, and, and just to conclude, the, an interesting thing is that the TVPA, the case that uh, one of the reasons that we got the TVPA, it was a domestic labor trafficking case that happened in Michigan that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and, and ultimately, the traffickers were exonerated because uh, we didn't have the presence of um, psychological coercion included in the definition of, and I think it was indentured servitude they were charged with. So that's one of the most important factors in the and the TVPA that we're grateful for. As Megan, as you were describing that, you know, I'm imagining a, a very wide spectrum of experiences that people have that don't, of course, always rise to the level of human trafficking. And I think that's always a part of the 
um, the challenge as agencies head into this work is, is to understand where to draw the line between one type of exploitation and um, another. And in addition to all that, we have baseline and definitional knowledge issues within the field of labor trafficking. My research with my colleagues in my, in my last project in Texas showed that the vast majority of, of the general public believes that human smuggling and human trafficking are synonymous. So just to be absolutely um, certain, Mike, could you talk us through in, in your mind and, and within your agency and how you define it how, how do you differentiate labor trafficking from labor exploitation from, of course, the, the totally separate issue of human smuggling? Sure, sure, yeah. No, in, in agriculture, um, unfortunately, we see all three, right? Uh, there, uh, we just can't seem to get away from this issue of whether it's, it's exploitation or trafficking or smuggling. Um, as we've mentioned before, um, labor trafficking is, is the use of force, fraud, coercion to make someone else work, right? That's kind of the basic, you know, uh, definition. Um, labor exploitation, which is where there's much more value extracted from workers than, than what is given to them, often goes hand in hand with labor trafficking, right? They sometimes are not separated from each other uh, at all. That's why labor trafficking and exploitation are associated with, with a continued debt, right? And in the worst cases, a perpetual debt, which is the, which is just the worst kind. Um, smuggling, on the other hand, uh, is prevalent not so much with the H-2A workers. It's really more with the non-H-2A workers, right? The folks like you know what we would normally call or migrant and seasonal workers, and that may come and go from, for example, Mexico on a on, on a back and forth basis, on an annual basis, um, and that's generally associated with one main debt, not so much a a continued or, or perpetual debt, debt is more associated with the one debt of transportation across the border, uh, perhaps the debt of the paperwork, right? Uh, the false documents that are often uh, provided as well. Uh, but we see that, you know, again, not so much a, a continued debt, but one main debt that is paid. And then once it's paid, generally, not always, but generally, then that person is free to go and do whatever they want to do. So, you know, those, that's some of the differences between labor trafficking and exploitation and then smuggling. And then also um, human smuggling is associated with the movement of individuals across country borders, while trafficking uh, can certainly occur both across country borders and then obviously within, within a country um, as well. So we have to be on the lookout for these little tiny differences because we certainly don't want to uh, to to move forward with a case, let's say, um, if we don't have all the right indicators in place. We want to make sure that we have the exact indicators that we're looking for that will allow us to prevail uh, in the end. And that's what you look for within the, the the Department of Labor. But of course, as field agencies, as outreach organizations. In, in whatever capacity we might be interacting with someone who may have experienced any of what you described, we don't necessarily have to um, determine exactly if, you know, if something met the definition or not. Maybe Katie and her team would choose you know, to have that conversation with a client about um, whether it's trafficking or something else, but at that very initial stage of identification, if someone knows, or even you know, in conversation, and of course with the consent of a worker, is discovering that there is something wrong, and maybe it, you can't quite name it. Um, they believe it might be a labor violation or potentially labor trafficking. Um, how do they take that next step and bring in, starting with you, Mike, your team um, at the U.S. Department of Labor? Sure, sure, yeah. No complaints um, of labor violations, uh, whether they be related to uh, improper payment of wages or, or other working condition violations, those can be submitted uh, at any of the wage and hour division offices across the United States, uh, or we have a national uh, phone number, which is a little bit easy to, to remember, 866, and then the number four, and then U.S. wage, so 866-4-U.S.-WAGE. Um, I invite everyone to please visit our webpage at dol.gov slash WHD for wage hour division. Um, and also, I, I want to make sure and, and mention, I want everyone to keep in mind that what may begin as just a simple wage complaint 
can turn into something else altogether that is much, much worse, right? So don't don't hesitate to call, really, is, is the message here. Um, you may not know what you have in front of you, um, but please don't 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 hesitate. You know, you may think, oh gosh, this is just you know a little tiny wage issue. I'm not even gonna bother calling because you know, what can they do? Well, it can turn into a big deal. Um, so don't hesitate, make the call, give us the information. Um, granted, not everything pans out, right? We have to vet the complaints and we have to make sure that we have the right information, but um, don't hesitate as my main message. one 4 us wage make the call, uh, tell us what's going on. What you may think is nothing can turn into a really big deal. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, one last thing I want to mention that I mentioned it already, but I wanted to mention it again. Uh, we will refer some of these complaints to the proper agency. If it's uh, something that is beyond wage and hour, we will assist you in making that uh, referral to uh, whatever the proper agency is. Yeah, so picking right right up on that, thinking around the corner a little bit. And by the way, we are going to uh, turn to your questions quite soon. So if you have not had a chance to go into the Q&A box, and let us know uh, what is on your mind or what questions you might have, please go, go right in um, and uh, type it in. Um, but thinking ahead uh, through a, a case referral like that, let's say that it does end up becoming a full-fledged um, labor trafficking case, the criminal justice system can only do so much and address so much out of what might be going on there. In many cases, a worker may not even be interested in that type of um, remedy. So sort of looking at the broader, uh, menu of, of things that we might be um, already thinking ahead to uh, in these cases. Um, Katie, from, from a service provider perspective, what assistance uh, would a, a survivor of labor trafficking usually need? And how do those needs differ from the average sex trafficking case? So labor trafficking victims really need most of the same services and assistance as sex trafficking victims. Um, Organizations that are already set up to serve sex trafficking victims are likely already set up in large part to meet the needs of labor trafficking victims. Um, and I think it's also important to remember that many, many cases of labor trafficking include an element of sexual abuse or sexual exploitation as well. So beyond the needs being similar or the same, many of the facts in a labor trafficking case may seem much more familiar than you expect them to be. Um, I think the immediate needs of a victim who has just escaped from their trafficker are fundamentally the same for sex and labor trafficking victims. Um, they're going to need physical safety, they're going to need medical care, psychological care, housing. Um, legally, I'm an attorney, um, those needs also look very similar. Sex and labor trafficking are both crimes. And so, um, although the law enforcement agency that you report to or you work with might differ, for example, we frequently make wage and hour division reports for our labor trafficking clients, we rarely do for our sex trafficking clients. Um, that process of working with law enforcement is also going to bring out a lot of the same needs in victims. So they're going to be, they're going to want to know about how confidential is the process. They're going to want to know um, how private is the information they share. They're going to want to talk about the risk of retaliation from the trafficker. And that, in my experience, is the same across labor and sex trafficking victims. Um, and then from an immigration perspective, the options are also the same. Um, the TVPA created a type of visa, the T visa, specifically for victims of human trafficking. And that is an equally good option and equally um, something that, that sex and labor trafficking victims are equally eligible for. Um, and so in terms of really the whole panoply of needs, I think they're much more similar than people might expect. Thank you. And um, we now have enough questions, I think, to start getting to the discussion. But before we do, I, I want to give uh, just a very big picture um, question to Megan, which is that if an agency um, that, like you said, Katie, might be set up to take on labor trafficking, but had just in practice has not had those cases, um, if they're looking to get more involved and, and build more resources around labor trafficking in particular, Megan, what are some uh, concrete first steps they can take in that direction? Sure. Well, first, a total shameless plug for Framework um, is to visit our website, frameworkta.org, 
we're a sort of sister project to the Capacity Building Center. We provide training and technical assistance to you guys, um, to service providers and their partners across the country to help you identify uh, labor trafficking victims in your communities to um, better serve them and to um, figure out how to partner with stakeholders in the community to inform a really well-coordinated, comprehensive community-based response. So. Um, on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter and get the latest labor trafficking news, information, and training opportunities. You can request individualized support. We'd really love to hear from you, especially those of you who, not especially, we'd love to hear from everybody, but we're hearing from a lot of folks, it's giving us a lot of energy, who are really expert at serving other populations and they approach labor trafficking with a little bit of hesitation because it's it's unfamiliar territory. And so um, we really start with where you're at and build off of the foundation that you already have, which is really strong. Um, and then also we have a resource library so you can check out some of the stuff that we've produced already. Um, in terms of, of building up your labor trafficking program, again, like if you're newer to it, I would suggest um, assessing your capacity and developing a plan to be able to respond. One thing that we hear is that, you know, folks say, I'm not getting referrals or we're just not seeing this as much in my community. And then once they serve one or two people, they see the referrals start to come. And so really having that proactive conversation in advance with your team and your leadership about how you'll respond to an increased caseload will be really important. Um, and then lastly, but importantly, uh, partner with survivors during the initial planning process and then throughout the evolution of your, your project. And of course, as you engage with them as consultants, pay them um, or even better hire them as staff if you're in a position to do that. Thank you so much. There is an elephant in the room in all these discussions about labor trafficking, especially, especially when it comes to outreach these days, which of course is that we are in the midst of a pandemic that for many of us has transformed the way that we do work. And of course, the industries that we've talked about today have been in many ways um, uh, severely impacted. So let's jump right into that one. Um, it, um, and uh, perhaps, uh, Mike, I'll, I'll start asking you in particular, in the agricultural sector, does the, the pandemic in your mind change any of what you've shared about the risk that, that is present in that community? Uh, sure. So the pandemic has changed literally everything, right? There is nothing that the pandemic has not touched, uh, including what we do and how we do it, right? Uh, we are, as investigators, we are very, very much boots on the ground, right? Uh, we are there seeing, smelling, hearing, talking to people, uh, conducting inspections, uh, everything, and all that, literally all of it, just gone. Uh, we had to pull back all our investigators. Uh, we had to you know, be, be very cognizant of their safety, uh, and we were at a real difficult crossroads, right? I mean, the safety of the worker versus the safety of our staff, uh, and I think as, as a lot of us that, that do this type of field work or any type of field work, uh, you found yourself at this crossroads and it was a really difficult place to be uh, because, you know, I, as advocates, we want to be out there and, and help. Um, but at the same time, we're dealing with a, a deadly pandemic uh, and we certainly had to be very, very careful. Um, so, yeah, uh, much more than an elephant in the room. It's a whole whole tribe of elephants in the room. Uh, as far as how it changed anything and everything that we do, we had to resort to conducting some investigations virtually, uh, which uh, sounds like a thing, honestly, but it, it, it's not effective, let's be honest, right? It's just not effective. Our work is on the ground. We need to talk to people on the ground, uh, not do uh, virtual investigations. But yeah, it has absolutely changed anything and everything for us. The last thing that I'll mention about that, which I think is the thing that I lament the most, is that we have, as a result, um, lost our presence, right? Our presence in the field is very, very important. And while we may not be conducting a thousand investigations every single day, when we conduct one or two in a particular area, the word spreads and suddenly people think that there are 500 wage an hour investigators on the field when really there might only be two or three. Um, and so that presence, that weight of our presence uh, has been very largely absent and people know they're not stupid. So um, we fear that once we get back into the field, um, we're going to find uh, something close to the wild, wild west out there. 
in the meantime, of course, when someone calls Ayuda, for example, Katie, there is someone on the other end of the line. And I, I wanna get over to you to hear more about that. Um, there was a request in, in the uh, Q&A for um, an example, a case example. I know that you wouldn't be able, of course, to share a real case, but if you um, had sort of, you know, a vignette or a, an anonymized one where you could change some facts about it, I think that would help us visualize what, what this type of work looks like right now. Um, so I'll give you a minute to think about that. I won't just put the spotlight on you right away, but before we turn to that, Megan, um, I wonder if you could get a little more into what labor trafficking in particular looks like within tribal communities. So this isn't, um, it's not an area of my expertise. What, um, what I would draw from is the fact that when we're, we're thinking about communities that, um, that are, are more isolated and hidden from, from plain view, a lot goes on behind the doors. And that's where, you know, to Mike's point about, um, about having activists and people being able to access communities and not just in an investigative sense, but in an interactive sense, just to, um, to have contact and make sure that people are protected. I think that that's something that especially during the pandemic is, um, is of concern. Thank you. And thanks to the person who put in that, that question. I think um, depending on what part of the country you are, um, those partnerships are so important to, to make sure that we're not just going out there with a one size fits all um, look at what this might uh, uh, be, um, how it, it might be manifesting in, in, in every part of our community. So um, bringing it back then to a more uh, concrete example, Katie, uh, do you, would you be able to share sort of a, an example of, you know, the phone rings, it, it, it does sound like it's labor trafficking. What could that look like in, in your world? Um, yeah. So gosh, it really can look like anything. Um, to sort of keep it within the realm of also responding to how the pandemic has, has changed things. Um, I can give an example, generalized example, um, from someone who I've been talking to this week. Um, we are still open for consults, um, but we're doing them by phone. And it's very difficult to build rapport and trust with clients over the phone in the best of circumstances. And it's really difficult um, when, for example, the person that you're talking to is a teenager who is living with parental figures who she hasn't seen in 15 years because they've been in the US and she's been in home country. And you can sort of tell that there's something off, but you really, really need to be able to put in the work to build that relationship before you find out what it is. And so this is, I think goes back to sort of knowing what those indicators are. Um, one pattern that we see a lot in Northern Virginia in particular, unfortunately, is unaccompanied migrant children who um, after crossing the border alone are reunified with a parent or a family member, an aunt or an uncle who they don't really know um, and who may be paid for their journey, may be paid for their bus ticket and expects that child to work um, to earn their way and to sort of work in exchange for rent, to work instead of going to school, to pay back. That's, that's a very, very common fact pattern that we see in Northern Virginia. Virginia gets a lot of those um, unaccompanied minors end up here. So I had a consultation with a 17 year old girl who had recently reunified with mom and stepdad who she didn't know. And there was just like something off with the way that she was talking about her relationship with her stepfather. Um, and when I asked her for more details, she really didn't want to talk about it. And it was a combination of she's in the house She's not leaving the house. She's going to school at home. She's, she's spending all of her time in the house where the potential bad actors also are. So there's just a question of physically, can the person get to a place where it is safe to disclose what's happening to them? And the answer I think in this case is that's been a little bit hard to figure out. And then also, um, how do you build a level of trust that's necessary over the phone with someone in that situation to get them to disclose something that could be going on with the person who is legally responsible for them. And that's hard to do in the best of circumstances, but it has been an, an outsized challenge doing everything remotely um, over the phone. And I don't, I don't necessarily have the answer. I'm still working on it. I'm still working through it. 
Um, but that's one concrete example of it happening yeah, as we speak. <laughs> we have another um, question that sort of builds in another case scenario. So let's, um, let's discuss this one. So um, this is from a nurse practitioner doing family planning and they, see, uh, they say that they see a lot of field workers. A lot of them are indigenous. Uh, so it's touching on some of what we've already discussed. Um, and in this scenario here, you have a person asking um, how they might be able to pay a coyote that helped them, a smuggler that helped them uh, come into the United States. So it's a two part, or I, I wanna make this into a two part question. Cause first of all, we know if someone is uh, saying that they have a debt to a smuggler, there's definitely human smuggling going on. Um, Mike, to reiterate your point from earlier, what would you have to know or find out about that case in your mind to take it from smuggling to a red flag for human trafficking or forced labor? Yeah, so th that's where that's where things get a little dicey, right? I mean, that's where you really need to start getting to some detail, which to go back to the comments I just made, that's also where the pandemic has really created a lot of problems for us. Katie just mentioned, you know, the difficulty in doing things virtually, not being there in person. Um, you know, one of the, as, as trained field people, whether you're an advocate or whether you're a federal investigator as myself, you need that in-person conversation, right? You need that trust, you need that bond, you need that eye-to-eye -eye conversation because you can read people, right? You certainly can, can just pick up so much on the body language, uh, in the look and the tone of the voice. Um, it, 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 it's a whole new ball game now in, in the worst way, right? I mean, it's already difficult enough to do this. Um, so, it, you know, when you're talking about, you know, somebody that is the, like the example that you gave, they're looking to pay their coyote, uh, you know, how do we do that? And then your question is, you know, what, what signs do we look for to differentiate between what might be smuggling than what might be labor trafficking? Um, we certainly look at, at we, we try to go back to all our training, right? We look at the standard uh, identifiers of labor trafficking. We want to make sure that you know, we want to know about the debt, right? Especially uh, when it comes to human smuggling. Um, when I when I mentioned earlier that that we tend to associate smuggling with a one-time debt, right? I mean, you you the coyote brings you to to the United States, you pay that debt, and generally off you go, right? Um, if that is the case, then we'll certainly classify it as smuggling. And, and if there's anything else that we need to do, we'll transfer that or refer, I should say, that information to our uh, criminal agencies. But for example, if this happens to be one of those occasions where somebody is smuggled for that one-time fee, what we would generally classify a one-time fee, but maybe it's not a one-time fee, right? Maybe it's, yeah, you owe me this much money, but I don't want you to pay it as a one-time fee. I don't want you to pay me the 8,000 US dollars in one chunk. I want you to work that off, right? And if you're going to be working that off, now your debt is almost perpetual uh, because then you're going to be paid for your services, maybe. Uh, and that's never going to be enough to pay your debt. So these are just a quick example of some of the some of the uh, uh, indicators that we look for. Um, we also, of course, if we're talking about smuggling, you know, we're gonna we're gonna generally have uh, documentation that is false, right? Uh, it's not going to be valid documentation. So we, you know, have to make sure that that we know what kind of documents we're talking about so that we know which referral to make. Um, none of this is easy, as you can tell, right? I mean, we're, we're, Megan's talking about all kinds of stuff and Katie's talking about all kinds of stuff and I'm throwing all this stuff out there. Um, I hope folks can realize out there that are listening that this is a really kind of tall task uh, and we have to kind of be on our toes, but but we can do this, right? We We have been very successful in, in catching these signs and doing something about it. Um, and that's the message here. Don't let the signs fall through the cracks. Um, do the, something with those signs. Yeah, part of the reason I picked this question out, out of the, the pile here is I, I can't tell you how many times um, in different agencies I've had that referral from a clinic, from a hospital, it's specifically from nurses who have just noticed or they, they noticed enough to know that something was going on. And that sometimes can be the start of a, some, a 10 year long journey with the legal aid or you, you name it, um, you know, getting someone in, incredible help and resources to really get out of a bad situation. Um, so I, I do wanna go to the second part of my question um, regarding that, which is okay, we know enough to know that it 
maybe a little more than smuggling. Um, there might be force, coercion, threats, maybe debt bondage going on. Um, who do we contact? Is it local law enforcement? Is it another group? Um, first, I'll ask you, Katie, at what stage in that scenario would uh, you that want to hear from, uh, from that worker? So we serve all low income immigrants, not just human trafficking victims. And so I would say as soon as you find out that someone is undocumented and is looking for help, we as immigration attorneys want to talk to them. Um, and we can really dive into the issue of what's going on with the coyote. I saw the, the person who posed that question added some additional information. They're saying it's a family member. They're saying it's not trafficking. None of that would stop me from continuing to try to find out if it's trafficking. Um, but that's not the responsibility of a nurse practitioner. That is my responsibility as an immigration attorney um, or Mike's, respons Mike's responsibility as an investigator into labor, you know, whatever. It's, it's sort of figuring out, is this something that is on your shoulders or can you send this person to someone who is an expert and who can sort of take it from there? Um, so that's what I would say. Just don't hesitate, even if you're not sure, even if you don't have any other information, make the referral because then it's in someone else's because they could qualify for something else. There could be a whole different immigration issue that's going on that we could offer them and it could help stabilize the situation that's going on with paying back this. I mean, you just never know how people's lives are connected and what could be going on. So I would say when in doubt, refer. And if you don't know who to refer to, um, Google it. <laughs> no, that's not a great answer. But you know, try to come up with a list or, or look into the resources that are available in your area for even if it's not exactly the right kind of organization, if it's somebody in the world of immigration and you can say, like, hey, I need help, who's a reliable immigration attorney? I can refer this person to that person can then help get the person in front of the right kind of office or something like that. The um the National Human Trafficking Hotline website will have a searchable list of, of who's active. Google is the best source for many things, including if you're looking for a local resource. So don't discount that. Go to Google as well. But I know the the trafficking center, um, the trafficking center, the um the uh, National Human Trafficking Hotline website has a searchable database of of resources uh, in local communities. So I'd recommend that. I also just want to share an experience from my former life in direct service. My team and I worked with a survivor who talked a lot about his experience intersecting with all of these different systems after he exited his trafficking situation. And he didn't know he was a trafficking victim for nearly two decades because when he went to a homeless shelter, they gave him a bed to sleep in. And when um, he went to the hospital, they took care of his, his physical condition and no one asked him that second question. So that's something that's always stuck in my head is his voice telling us like, ask another question. Don't just address the thing that people come in your doors to address. Um, so as a nurse practitioner, it is about, you know, you build some trust and then you figure out, well, what does that person need? And um, it's really important that you have a sense of what it is that they want um, and not make assumptions about, oh, I'm going to call the authorities because I think you're in danger. Make sure they have an understanding about what you're going to do and that they agree that that's um, the best idea for them. I also just want to jump in here just because we are talking about the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And as an immigration attorney, I think what I'm about to say is maybe a little controversial, but I feel an obligation to say it. Um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline is an excellent resource for referring someone to services. Um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline has an option where they will ask if the person would like them to report to law enforcement on their behalf. And I would just say for immigrant victims, saying yes to that question through the National Human Trafficking Hotline can actually be a very dangerous thing. Um, depending on the person's immigration history and current immigration status. And so I would just say my pitch as an immigration attorney is to not put someone in to, into direct, who is not in an emergency safety situation into direct contact with law enforcement until that person has an attorney who can advise on how to do it safely for them. Because it is possible to make a situation worse rather than better if you get in front of the wrong law enforcement agencies. Thank you. And I think it ties into the broader theme that, that we've uh, heard today from, from all of you about a victim-centered approach, meaning that at the end of the day, although one of the outcomes for some of the agencies involved is going to go after the human traffickers um, and potentially 
uh, pursue them criminally or whatever that might be, a worker is not a means to that end alone, of course. You know, if they choose to participate in that process, of course, um, there, there are ways to do that. But um, there are plenty of ways that, that we all unfortunately have, have to become aware of that um, people can end up um, in a worse situation if the referrals are not done well, or if someone like Katie is not in the room to really think through all the eventualities and all the ways that things have played out in the past, especially when it comes to immigration. I hope you all can connect with experts like, like her when, when these cases begin to uh, develop. Mike, I have a quick one for you and then we'll, we'll keep um, going down the list here. Um, what percentage, if you could estimate, of cases that begin as a wage complaint might develop into um, labor trafficking? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, you know, as far as giving an exact percentage, uh, there's no way I could give an exact percentage. I can, you know, give you kind of an idea. Um, it's funny because we were kind of discussing this just the other day when we were chatting, uh, because, you know, we have a situation where, you know, right now, if I were to kind of sit here and think off the top of my head uh, about what uh, percentage of the cases that we normally see turn into something else, um, that percentage is going to sound relatively low, right? Um, really, I don't think anything more than two or three percent of all the cases that we do turn into something more that turns into a labor trafficking case or a criminal case. And what I, the, the message I don't want people to get is that, wow, that sounds like nothing. Well, no, that's not nothing because when you're talking about investigations, when I'm talking about maybe one or two or three percent of the cases, that can impact a thousand workers. Right. I mean, each one of these cases, some of these farm labor contractors, they don't bring in five or 10 people. They bring in 300, 400, 800 people, a thousand people at the same time. And that could be one case. Right. So imagine other cases would it just exponentially grows in the uh, the effect that it can have on an exponential number of people. So don't don't make it don't I don't want people to think, oh, it's, it's just a few. It's no big deal. No, it's a it's a really big deal. Yeah, I think of, you know, uh, in the agricultural sector, one farm labor contractor by design would interact with hundreds, if not over the years, thousands of individuals. And um, even if in every case, it's not rising to the level of labor trafficking, there are all sorts of ways that people can really be hurt by coming across a bad actor in that way. So um, every one of the referrals in, in some way could, could, um, could help um, get someone like that out of the supply chain and out of the picture in some of these industries. Um, we have a question that goes more to the topic of um, awareness, training, education, um, what initiatives are out there. And I, I would guess maybe, Megan, you would be more aware of this at a national level right now, but anyone feel free to jump in. Um, what can the average person in the average state expect to come across these days by way of advertising, PSAs, um, you know, do we think that the general public is getting this information or are we really on our own trying to get the word out? Um, both. Um, there are some national initiatives. I think Mike talked about the DHS, uh, the blue campaign is a big one that I think many of us have seen in different places. It does, it varies because states take on um, some more and some less. Here in Illinois, we had a, a posting bill pass a couple years ago that mandated um, advertisements to, to, to show indicators of human trafficking in um, transportation hubs and certain types of bars and restaurants. Um, but that also, it didn't have really a lot of teeth to it. So there's no like, if you don't do this, you know, here's what, here's what will happen. So. It depends on what laws are passed. It depends on um, the, the follow-up to, to make sure that's happening. What we see is that service providers like you and me, um, our own organizations will print resources that we find um, you know, through the, the trafficking, the, um, the hotline <laughs> website, the, uh, the, the blue campaign and other sources and print them ourselves and put them up in spaces where we anticipate that victims and survivors are interacting with. So places like grocery stores or local markets, healthcare facilities, laundromats, money transfer centers are really big, um, post offices, religious centers. Um, so um, so yeah, it really does, it varies, it varies tremendously. 
one more question and then we'll start wrapping it up. Um, Katie, I think this is an important one and, and I'll turn to you for it because you all are um, experts on cases involving immigrants. Um, someone asked what, um, what translation services are available for victims when, when they, uh, for example, do call the hotline or other resources and does that include pre-Hispanic languages, uh, for example, that someone might speak even if they're from uh, Mexico or Central America and don't speak Spanish, Mixteco, that, that type of thing. Um, what comes to mind for that? So if I am being completely candid, I have not spoken with the National Trafficking Hotline in some time. Um, when we do, because our staff are all bilingual English Spanish, um, it hasn't been an issue. Um, I'm trying to remember, I did call with a French speaking client and I can't remember if I had a telephonic interpreter already on the phone or if they were able to access it. Um, I think that they are able to get um, access to language line, to interpreter through language line. Now, obviously that resource does not have indigenous languages. Um, that is a real struggle. I have had success with, um, there's an agency, the it's called, I think, 1855 Maya USA. That's the phone number. And if you Google that, you'll get their website also. Um, and they have certainly Central American indigenous interpreters. We've used Ixchil and Mom interpreters through there. I'm not sure about um, indigenous languages from other regions of the Americas. I'm sorry that I don't have a more complete answer on that. I just took your advice, Katie. I Googled it real quick. And they say that help is available in English or Spanish or in more than 200 additional language through an on-call interpreter. Google. Thank you, Thank you so we'll much. We're being, uh, we're being as resourceful as, as we said we would be. And uh, sorry, go ahead, Tracy. I was just going to thank everyone. We are right up at our time. So thank you, Gonzalo, for moderating this very engaging and informative conversation. We have many questions in the, the question feature that were not answered. We plan on um, sharing that out in a document um, with everyone post-meeting. And please contact the Human Trafficking Capacity Building Center if you need support with any of your human trafficking needs, as well as the framework ta.org for specific labor trafficking questions. Thank you everyone for joining our session and we will be in touch with those follow-up materials. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.